Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads... Bless is he who reads, <clears throat> underline it in your Bible, bless is he who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy, <clears throat> and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from God, and from him, rather, who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests, to God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The book of Revelation is one book that most people throw away. They don't even attempt to read it because of some of the language, some of the apocalyptic type of literature that is written in and some of the symbolism in some sense. But it wasn't symbolism to the point that the reader who would read this and hear this <clears throat> did not understand this book. They would understand this book. In fact, they would completely understand the reason why it'd be written in, in such symbolism in so many ways. Because if you know the background to this book, possibly written around A.D. Um, 95 or A.D. 96, <clears throat> there was a wicked emperor who reigned from September the 14th, A.D. 81, through September the 18th, A.D. 96, by the name of Domitia. If we thought Nero was bad, he made Nero work look like kindergartner work. He was one of the most wicked, ruthless emperors there, there was. Son of Titus, grandson of Vespasian. He was just one of the wickedest emperors in, in the Roman history. And he persecuted the church beyond measure. Hundreds and thousands of Christians lost their life under his emperorship. He was just a wicked man. He had no regard for human life. And when they write this letter, I'm sure they didn't want it to get in the hands of any Roman officials whatsoever because it would have made life much worse. And so John uses certain language that the reader would have understood. And it would not have been something strange. It would have been something that the reader would have been so happy to read. And, 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 and you look at the book of Revelation, and, and we know that, you know, people struggle with this. And, they, you know, the book of Revelation, you have to read, you know, or be familiar with the Old Testament. You know, Daniel, when Daniel writes, he gives us a snapshot of some of these things. You know, but, but when John writes here, he gives us much more detail about the things that are going to come. You know, and it, it seems like, you know, <clears throat> some of the key words in his book sort of get me kind of excited because he says like. <clears throat> so like is something that is like, is, is, you know, when something, somebody says this is like a, a red horse or this is like an uh, animal or this is like an airplane. This is, they don't mean that it is an airplane. They just describe in the best as they could what it's like. So when you, when you see Revelation, it's like because he's describing something that he's explaining it the best that he could as, a, as an apostle writing as almost like a, a stenographer or some type of secretary as the Lord Jesus was narrating to John what to write or, or, or telling them what you should write. And so when, when you read that, you look at that word like, 
You know, then he saw, has the word Saul. Forty-two times the word Saul is mentioned, that, that he saw. You know, what did he see? You know, he saw what he saw. He, he saw, you know, the word lamb. Twenty-eight times Jesus is described as a lamb. And it's interesting, the funny thing almost makes me laugh. And this is the wrath of a lamb. You ever heard of the, a lamb with a wrath, you know? And he's, the lamb is mentioned 28 times. Almighty... The Old Testament, we know that is El Shaddai. It's mentioned eight times. He mentions throne 37 times, more than any other book in the entire Bible, throne. Because kings have thrones on earth, but there's a throne that's greater than all other thrones. That every knee will bow one day to, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He mentions the word right 14 times. is mentioned more than any other book in the Bible. He says write, write it down. Plague is mentioned 12 times more than any other New Testament book. He says the word plague. Seven times John is going to say, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In Revelation 2.7, in Revelation 2.11, Revelation 2.17, Revelation 2.29, Revelation 3.6, and Revelation 3.13. And in Revelation 3.22, he's going to say, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So so there's a lot of things that are, are happening in this book called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not revelations with an S, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation singular. The, the revelation, you know, is the five key words to understand in this book. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Those five important words. You know, 22 chapters, 404 verses, and it says, King James Version, exactly 12,000 words. The, the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you have to read Old Testament scripture. You know, one of the King James Study Bibles stated that of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, 265 verses contain lines that allude to some 550 Old Testament references. It's interesting. So there's no need for any of us in here to try to make an outline for the book of Revelation. There's no need. You don't have to make an outline. This is a book that comes, you know, with a divine outline. You know, look down at verse 19. I'll, I'll read it and we'll come back. But look at verse 19 in this letter. It, it, it says that, write the things which you have seen. That's past tense, the things which, within this chapter, first chapter. And the things which are, pre, uh, are, which are, which is present tense, the church age. And the things which will take place after this, the future tense. You know, that, that Greek word, metatalta. You know, and, you know, in chapter 4, verse 1, he's going to tell him, you know, after these things I looked and behold a door of standing open and so forth. And he tells, you know, the, to write these things. And, you, and when you start reading the Revelation, you start realizing that when you read chapter 1, then you go chapter 2 is the church. Chapter 3 is the church. Chapter 4, the church is taken out of here. Chapter 5 and 4 is in a heaven scene in a sense. Chapter 6 through 19 is the, revel the you know, the, the revelator John writes about the great tribulation. So when you read chapter 6 through 19, that's the great tribulation. And then by the time you get to chapter 19, verse 10, Christ is coming back riding with a horse, juice it with 10,000 of his saints in Jude 9. We will be riding back with them coming back, not for his church, with the church to rule and reign for a thousand years, which we call the kingdom age. A thousand years. And so we should be excited. And But there is a warning to anyone that reads this letter. It's a blessing and a warning all at the same time. Turn to the end of the book, chapter 22. I want to show you all this before we get in this so you can have a, a little picture in your mind. Chapter 22, verse 18, John writes this. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. 
And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. No other book in the Bible says that. No other book in the Bible says that. And so when we get back to chapter 1, verse 1, it says, the revelation, the Greek word apocalypsis, which means unveiling or a disclosure or a discovery of who Jesus Christ is. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So these five words, they, they simply almost give you the theme of the book, the subject of the book. You know, the title of the book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember... Um, the young man that was with Peter by the name of John Mark, when he wrote the Gospel of Mark, he says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Here it says, John, who writes <coughs> the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. And one might add, you might think, if you're a thinker, you might think like I think sometimes when I read scriptures. You know, what in the world would, would John need to see right at this point about Christ? He walked with him for, you know, in his public ministry. He stood at the cross when Jesus was on the cross. And he says, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. John was with him. John was the first one to run to the tomb. And he saw the Lord gone, you know, just his handkerchief clothes, you know, folded neatly. John saw the resurrected Savior. John saw Jesus transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. You know, Peter, James, and John, you know, Jesus, you know, <clears throat> his flesh must have just, you know, was moved out of the way. And all his glory, he shone like the sun. You know, they said his clothes was whiter than any laundry could get them. Or, you know, and, and John saw so much. He, he seen him walk on water. He seen him do miracle after miracle. He was the youngest of all the apostles. And imagine how impressionable that would have been on his heart. To, to see all of these things and to know all of these things. And now the revelation of Christ, what, what do you mean? I, I've seen him before. But no, no, because you know what Paul wrote? That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That he will, he'll be unfolding throughout eternity. We'll learn who Jesus is. And he said the revelation of Jesus Christ. John, didn't you know him? Didn't you see him? Didn't you lean on his bosom at the Lord's Supper? Wasn't you there, John? But there was something John didn't see and John didn't know. He's on this small little island, the island of Patmos, as he writes. Possibly banished there, you know, and they put him in this hot cauldron of boiling hot grease. And they thought they would kill John the Apostle and, you know, they take the lid off and ta-da, he's still alive. And they must have said, well, I'll get this guy out of here. You know, it's interesting to see this. He says, John writes, he says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, notice, gave, you know, gave him to show his servants. You know, because those who serve the Lord appreciate this book more than those who don't serve the Lord. That you read this and you under this Roman emperor, this persecution, and you saying, oh man, this is persecution. But man, one day we're going to come back and reign with the Lord. This is nothing compared to what we have, you know, in our, you know, I, for I consider that the present sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that not revealed to us in us. And, and, and uh, the, you know, he says, which he gave to his servants. Things which must shortly take place. And the word shortly means quickly or immediately. This means that once the things start, they will gain velocity, rapid succession. Once the tribulation, meaning the great tribulation, when once it begins to unfold, it's going to be fast and it's going to happen. You boom, bam, boom, boom. And as you read this letter and you start getting to chapter 6 and so forth, it happens. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, you know, and, and it happens in succession and quickly, and, and it happens rapidly, velocity, velocity. And he, meaning Christ, sent and signified it by an angel. This revelation was given by an angel to his servant John, the apostle John. 
And he writes his name here, John. The same John who wrote the Gospel of John, the same John who wrote 1 John, the same John who wrote 2 John, and the same John who wrote 3 John wrote the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And he sent and signified it by his angel. An angel, you know, gave it. And you, you won't mess up if you send an angel to give something to somebody. To his servant John, who bore witness to the word, the logos of God, and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. So John says every detail that he's about to share with his audience, he was an eyewitness of. He saw it. Through revelation or through demonstration, he saw it. He saw it. Notice that as we come to verse 3, John mentions the blessing that comes with reading this book. Look what he says. Blessed. This is the word that Christ used often when he taught the Beatitudes. Blessed. Makarios. It means, oh, happy. <laughs> happy. Happy or blessed is he who reads this book. Look. This is the only book in the Bible that says, blessed is he who reads. And nobody reads it. Nobody reads it. They look, hey, that's the revelation, man. I don't know about all that stuff, man. I don't really know. They don't read it. Nobody reads it. Because people say, I can't understand that book. Oh, you can understand that book. You're a servant of God. It was written to servants of God. Those who serve the Lord and love Jesus Christ and allow the spirit of truth to rest upon their bosom as they read this with an open heart to Jesus Christ. You can understand this book. And not only can you understand it, when you read it, it's a blessing. Happy is the person that reads this book. He says, blessed is he who reads, notice, and those who hear the words of this prophecy, because faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and keep those things which are written in it. So there's a blessing for the person who reads and hears this book and who keep this book. The word keep, it means to watch over, to guard, to detain. So as this letter was written to the seven churches in Asia Minor, and you get this, and so you get a picture of this. The pastor, which is later on going to be described as the angel of the church. The pastor would get up and read this book aloud, maybe on a Sunday night or something. He would read this book because they didn't have Bibles in the first century. You came in the first century church. Y'all got Bibles? No, everybody didn't have Bibles. Didn't that Bible tell years later that everybody could come to church and have a Bible? We should be thankful for that, that you could have a Bible. And that they, he, the pastor would get up and he would read this letter uh, aloud. And, and, and as he re read it, they, they, they would listen. The audience would be blessed hearing the letter read aloud. They would just be blessed hearing them read this letter aloud. And when they left the local assembly or the gathering, they were to keep it. They, they were to keep it through the Spirit of the Lord as they obeyed it. That's how you kept it, because you obeyed with what was read in the letter. So read, hear, and keep. What a blessing that is. Because so many in the people in the church have never read the book of Revelation. Some pastors just bypassed this book. They said, no way in the world I'm going to try to teach my church this letter. I'll teach them something simple, but not this one. And, and essentially, this is a simple letter. If you dig deep in it and you read it and you read it in the context that is written in and how it was meant to be written in and not try to spiritualize it and overthink it, you read this letter, it's something that you can. And remember this, you can't understand it. You say, Lord, help me. I don't understand. It, give me understanding. And God is not in heaven is going to say, no, I don't want to give you understanding about my word. That ain't going to happen. So what a blessing this was because many, you know, people would just read this and boy, if you read this during the persecution that the church was under, you'll be praise the Lord. Thank you, John. Thank you for writing this letter. I don't know how it got delivered to who it needed to be delivered to, but thank you, God, for letting John write this letter. Thank you, Jesus, for this letter. For the time is near. This is the attitude we should have in regards to the revelation of Jesus Christ and things to come, living as though the end times are already here. 
which they are. They are near. And now John gives us a second greeting, but now to the churches. This is John, verse 4, to the seven churches which are in Asia. And you think of Asia, you start thinking of China, Japan, North Korea, South Korea, India, you know, the Philippines, Malaysia, you know, uh, Indonesia. You, thought, you think of Asia, you think of all the Pacific Ocean, you know, nations. Here, Asia is not Asia, that Asia. This is Asia Minor, which is in Turkey. Modern-day Turkey, so it would be the church in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, it would be Sardis, Philadelphia, and the church of Laodicea. Those are the seven churches that this letter is going to be dispersed to. So he says that John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace. This is the order. That was a common greeting. Grace was already always before peace because you cannot have peace without grace. And grace and peace is a picture and the summary of where we stand with the Lord. Grace speaks of God's love and thoughts toward each and every one of us who have accepted Jesus Christ. For the scripture says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves as a gift of God. You know, and peace speaks of our standing with God. Remember when Paul wrote the church in Rome, he says, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is grace, peace, and comes, and this is where it comes from. From him, meaning God, who is infinite. And you'll see the Trinity in this, too. From him, God, who is and who was and who is to come. He's outside of time. And notice, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ. Yeah, and you see that that's the Trinity there. And, and people get lost in it. They say, hold it, wait. John just said something. Hold it. He just said seven spirits. What in the world is the seven spirits? Why did he say seven spirits? And he's talking essentially, I'm sure, about the attributes of the spirit. Because in, if you read um, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, he said that the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, meaning the Messiah, it shall rest upon, that's number one, and as the spirit of wisdom, number two, the spirit of understanding is number three, the spirit of counsel is number four, the spirit of might is number five, the spirit of knowledge is number six, and the fear of the Lord is number seven. So that's the complete work of the spirit. People spiritualize it. Well, we're remain seven spirits. They'll go spend hours to acknowledge you to try to figure that out. Because of the one word seven. Seven is the number of what? Completion. And from Jesus Christ, verse five, this is the Trinity. And notice the faithful witness. Faithful means true and accurate. Witness. Jesus is accurate, the accurate witness of the Father, not man, you know, because we all fall short of his glory. But Jesus is his the definite article, the faithful witness. You know, how people say, well, I don't go to that church no more. I don't like that pastor. You know, he'd make me sick to go to that church. That's how carnal and immature a person could even think. Because the only faithful witness is Jesus Christ. It's not a man. He's the only faithful witness. You, you've been, I don't like those people down there. They make me sick. They get on my nerves. Well, really, welcome to the club. The people you don't like, they might not like you neither. Because none of us are faithful witness. He is the, faith, the definite article, the faithful witness. The only faithful witness. We're not faithful witnesses. We go in and out. One day you're a faithful witness. One day I'm a faithful witness. The next day I'm not. Well, every day I'm a faithful witness. You're a liar if you say that. Because we're human beings. He is the. It says, you see that the in front, front of that? That means definite articles. That the, the faithful witness. And here it says, the firstborn from the dead. 
And the firstborn in that culture was privileged and, and, and a special uh, a place, to say the least, to be. The, the firstborn, even to the point that when the father died in a family, the firstborn would have authority and would receive a double inheritance. The, the, the firstborn. Remember what Paul wrote, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the first, f- firstborn from the dead, that all things, you know, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And here John writes the firstborn from the dead. This is not saying that that Jesus was the first one raised from the dead. It's not saying that. And we know that's not true. Because you remember the woman in Shunem? She, you know, he was, she, you know when um, her, 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 the, her son was raised from the dead by um, e- 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 Elijah. Remember that Elijah raised a, a person from the dead in 1 Kings 17? Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 32, verse 3 through 37. Remember, remember Jairus' only 12-year-old daughter was raised from the dead? Remember Lazarus was raised from the dead? Remember that? Remember that, you know, the, the woman of Nain, only son, he was raised off that coffin from the dead. There were people raised from the dead in the New Testament before Jesus Christ. So we know he's not really talking about that in that sense. He's talking about the uniqueness and authority of his resurrection. Because look, all those who were raised from the dead died again. Jesus was resurrected to live. He would never die. Because he's going to say later on in verse 8, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning of the end. So you know the firstborn from the dead, meaning that it's something of authority. He says, no man take my life. I lay it down. I have the power. And he uses the word power in John, exousia power, delegated authority to take it up again. No one takes my, I have a power to, you know, he's the only, all of them died, but they didn't have the power to raise themselves. None of them had the power to raise themselves back up. Jesus had to raise them up. None of them, nobody in the New Testament had the power to raise themselves up. And Jesus raised them up. He raised them up. So the resurrection was like no other. You remember in Romans, when Paul said in Romans 1, 4, Paul says, and declared to be the son of God with power according to the, the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So no one could could, could compare to Christ being the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. He's the Lord of Lord, King of Kings. Amen? Amen? He is the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Jesus will come and rule and reign. And I love what the prophet Zechariah says in Zechariah. He says that, and the Lord shall be king of all the earth. And that day shall be the Lord is one and his name is one. I love what he says. And the ruler of the kings of the earth to him who, is, who loved us. And John is on this island and, and what a wonderful, you know, exhortation to know that he loves us even when we've been persecuted, even when we're sick, even when sorrow comes, even when death comes in our families, when we lose loved ones, when we're broken and all the things that, you know, you, you, you know that wave of love that you sometimes sense from God's presence from Jesus Christ, that love when you need it, when you're down and out and somehow he comes in loves us and nobody understands it neither you just know in your heart like this wave of love I needed it I needed this love I really needed this love this this love was something that I needed and he comes and he shows up and John says to him who loved us and this is how he demonstrated his love and washed us from our sins in his own blood And that's more than just covering our sins. Jesus sacrificed his death on the cross, provided for us a washing away of our sins. And has made us, this is every believer sitting here and every believer in the entire world. Not that we were anything apart from his cleansing blood, but now he makes us, notice, kings and priests. To his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He makes us kings, kingdom children. You're part of a kingdom now. I love that video of the the Thanksgiving dinner when they said, the the kid, they tell the kid, you're not part of the family. And he just takes the turkey and flips everything over, you know. But, But God don't do that to us. We are in the family. 
We're blood bought. We are blood bought. And what a joy. Look, what a joy. He says, you know, kings and priests, because priests represented God to the people, and they had, and they and they supposed to live a lifestyle that represented that. And in our case, we are ambassadors of Christ, you know, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He uses us to draw people to himself. He uses us as priests in this world. We are priests, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, Peter says. In 1 Peter 2, 9, a royal priesthood. Did you wake up in the morning and say, hey, by the way, I'm a king, I'm a priest. I'm sure you didn't. And now John takes us to the second coming of Christ. You know, you can read Daniel 7, 14 and get a good picture of that too. Verse 7 says, behold, he is coming. And this is saying that the process has already begun. But where will you be when he returns? He is coming with clouds. And John was the one standing there when Christ ascended into heaven, remember? In the Revelation, I mean, not in the Revelation, in um, Acts chapter 1, they were all standing around. And then all at once, Jesus was just went up like a helium balloon right before him. And went, 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 kept going up and kept going up. And, and they said, what are you men of Galilee gazing up? This Jesus is coming back in like manner. The two angels clothed in, in white garments told the apostles that. Behold, he is coming with clouds, notice, and every eye, <clears throat> every eye will see him. This is not done in secret. Even they who pierced him, you know, Zechariah 12, 10. Because, you know, out of the 404 verses in the Bible, we talked about that. You know, in the Old Testament, 27 references is Exodus, 22 references in Jeremiah, 43 references from the Psalms, 79 in Isaiah, 43 in Ezekiel, 15 in Zechariah, and, and 53 from the book of Daniel mentions, you know, Jesus Christ. You know, in alluding to him in the revelation of Christ. And, and John says, behold, he is coming, second return of Christ, with clouds, and every eye will see him, even <clears throat> they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. That's not the church because he's already snatched us out. We're coming back with him. We won't be mourning. We'll be rejoicing. He snatches us out with the, with the trump of God, with the voice you know, of an archangel. He snatches the word snatch, raptured us, horopazo, to snatch by force when we're taken out of here. That, that's what he says in regards to the rapture. We're not here when this happened. When the tribulation period happened, the church is not here. The church is taken out of the way. You won't allow us to suffer with the wicked? That makes no sense. That would be a cruel dad to, to beat you for something that somebody else did. So he won't allow us to suffer with the wicked. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Now we hear the voice of the Lord speaking. You know, it says, I am the Alpha. Because if you got Bible that got read, it's probably written in red in your Bible. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the, the first and the last letters, <coughs> letters of the Greek alphabet. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. Notice, who is who was and who is to come, the almighty El Shaddai, the big breasted one, the big covering one. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. You know, Isaiah wrote, listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, my, my called. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they shall stand together. This is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Is he a beginning and the end? It starts with Jesus and it all ends with Jesus. Amen? Amen? It starts with Jesus and it all ends with Jesus. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I'm glad about that. I'm glad about that. You know, the question is, do you know Jesus? You know, people say, do you know Jesus? You no, know, you read the revelation of Jesus Christ, you'll know Jesus. <laughs> you, you read this, <clears throat> he says, I want to know more about Jesus. Read the unveiling and the unfolding of who he is. It's his 
story. We call it history, but it's his story. That's whose story it is, his story. I, I encourage you, I advise you, you know, love you guys enough to say this. Read this book. Read it. I remember a brand new Christian trying to read the Revelation, and you know, I was like, well, I don't understand this. Well, I don't know. And I started, I kept reading, and I kept writing notes. I said, well, and before I, by the time I got done, I said, wow, this is something I, I, I sort of understand this book. Because it's a blessing attached to reading it. It's a blessing attached to hearing it. And there's a blessing attached to keeping it and guard it. Guard it. Because this is what we're going to need during the days we live in. We're going to have to know who Jesus really is. Not who we think he is or, or I really feel good because I'm part of a church. Or I really, no, 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 no. Look, we're going to have to know who Jesus really is in these days we live in. Persecution will arise in the church. It will. It is inevitable that persecution will arise. And the church may be scattered. But nobody can take the word of God from us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray as we look to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your love today, Lord. Your grace is sufficient for us. Give us a heart of Jesus today. Teach us your ways. Give us wisdom as we study this book, Lord. Make it so plain to everyone that's listening, Lord, that they would be excited and drawn to the word of God. Not excited about the preacher, but excited about the message that John has for the church. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would bless us would keep us be magnified in our midst we love you we honor you and we praise you in the matchless name of Jesus Christ we pray amen and listen if you don't know Jesus Christ let me tell you something there is something that's going to come upon this world that every person is going to wish they have given their life to Christ. There will not be one person during the tribulation period, and it'll be a group, I'm sure, but it won't be one person in their right mind that say, oh, man, I wish I would have listened to my aunt or my uncle or my, my cousin or whoever. They're gone now, and you just can imagine what excuse they're going to find when the church gets raptured. Could you imagine the excuse they're going to come up with? CNN and, and, you know, and whatever other stations they tried to put it on, and some of those news anchors and so forth are Christians, they're going to be gone too. Some of the cameramen are Christians. Some of the pilots are Christians driving planes. Some of you know, the conductors of, um, of Amtrak, and they're, Christ, they're going to be gone. And the, and the world and its sickness is going to try to explain that. We don't have to. We've got the Bible. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great afternoon. God bless you.